Hey, C3 family, thanks for joining us here again today in our online church experience. Hope you've been having a great week and uh, looking forward to uh, the service today as we worship. And uh, I've got a great word I want to share with you a little later on. Hey, if you're um, just uh, joining us and maybe you're living in our region and uh, you're just be, uh, connecting up with us here online, but you'd love to be in one of our in-person gatherings, we have three areas in which we have in-person gatherings in the region at the moment. Uh, one in Revelstoke, one in Vernon, and one in Kelowna. And if you happen to be in the area, our gathering times are 10 o'clock on Sunday. Love to have you join us. Uh, but hey, for today, we're here together online, and so let's uh, let's gather together. Let's just worship for a little bit, and then uh, and then I'm going to come back and share the word this morning.
Welcome back. How good it is to be able to worship together, even if it's online. And uh, I know that uh, still numbers of us are uh, you know, choosing to uh, uh, connect online and I'm grateful for that opportunity to do that. And maybe you just weren't able to get to an in-person gathering. And of course, if you're sick or um, suffering from any symptoms, uh, any uh, cold symptoms, just glad that you could join us online. Hey, we're going to uh, just going to go to the book of Colossians uh, this morning or today, and I, I want to talk about you know everybody has uh, I, I think there's this inner inner desire in everybody to live a fruitful, meaningful life, 
Uh, God put us on earth for a purpose, and most of the time we spend our life trying to fulfill that purpose. And I, I, As I was reading Colossians a while ago, I, I came across these couple of verses, and, and just as I was reading them, I went, well, these are, these are just keys to how we live a fruitful life. This is just really Paul summing it all up and how we can live a fruitful life, a, a life that is, um, produces beneficial and um, productive, successful outcomes from all of our efforts. And so here we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 to 10. And if you're following along, you can look it up in your New Living Translation on New Version or whatever uh, Bible version you have, whether a paper version or a digital version. But here it says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 to 10, So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. Uh, that's pretty cool. Anyway, just to start that off with, that Paul would say, hey, we just haven't stopped praying for you since we just heard about you, not just met you, but heard about you. That's pretty cool. And he says this, he says, we ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then, that word then is pretty important because it says that if, if this first part is true, then the second part is true. So if God gives you spiritual wisdom and understanding, knowledge of his will, then, verse 10, the way you live will always honor and please the Lord and your lives will produce every kind of fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Man, I love that. Then you will live a life. Then you will live, the life you live will always honor God. Man, that's just something that I think every one of us who are followers of Christ and believers is, would love to know that and have that certainty and assurance that our life is honoring God and pleasing God. And Paul says that that can happen. And he says, you can, you can live a life that honors God, that pleases God, and your life will produce every kind of good fruit. You'll be fruitful. You'll have a beneficial, successful outcome from your efforts. I want to get to the end of my life feeling like I had a lot of good fruit in my life, that there were a lot of good outcomes, that there were a lot of successful results from the efforts and the work I put into living a godly life. And, and so this is what Paul's talking about to the church in Col Colossae, uh, this group of believers who he hadn't even met yet, but he's saying, hey, here's the key. And it's, it's almost like he says, here's, let me just hand you this, this secret prerequisite to a fruitful life. And so I want to talk to you today, and we're just going to go into this a little bit, about three prerequisites to a fruitful life. Just three things that we need to, if we get these things solid in our life, then the other stuff builds on top of it. If, if we have these three things just firm, they're like a firm foundation, we can't build anything solid if we don't have it, but if we have these three things firm in our life, then it'll allow us to live a fruitful, God-honoring, God-pleasing, a life of constant growth in our spiritual world. So let's, uh, let's look at the first one. Here, verse 9. It says, So we've not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will. So here Paul's saying, he said, we want you to have a good grasp, we want you to have good knowledge of what God's will for your life is. And I remember as a, uh, a young, you know, as a teenager, uh, everybody always talked about, what's the will of God for my life? I'm trying to find God's will for my life. You know, and that was, you know, as, as thinking of, you know, years and years of future and, you know, what would I do for God and all those things. I'm thinking, what's going to be God's will for my life? And I wish somebody had sat me down at that point in time instead of just trying to figure out, you know, all the specifics of should I do this or should I do that, that he'd help me to understand that the will of God is in the word of God. That when we understand God's will, it's because we understand God's word. When we grab a hold of God's word, we can hear and we can see what God's intentions are. You know, sometimes we, we often use the word the will of God, but maybe it's easier at times if we could just um, rephrase it a little bit and say, well, what are God's intentions for your life? And when I look into the Bible, the Bible is full of what God intend, intends for my life, the intentions of my life. And so how do we find out God's will or God's intention for our life? Well, there's, there's two things that, that are important. One is the word of God, which is always, I've already said, but also godly counsel, godly counsel. So if we have the will of God, if we kind of get an understanding from the Bible, what the intention of God is for those who follow him. 
You know, Paul lays out some things. He says, intention is for you to honor God. Intention is for you to please God. Intention is for you to be fruitful, produce good outcomes in your life. The intention for, of God is for you to grow and, and learn and to know God better and better. So those are some of the intentions of God. So that's, that's from the Word. But to personalize that and kind of say, okay, how does that specifically apply to me and some of the things in my life? I'm still trying to discover some of God's intention for the next stages of my life. And I, I do that by not just trying to get it just in the Word, but I also bring in godly counsel. So I, I talk to some people who know me and they see me in a way that I don't see myself. Sometimes my own perspective on my life, sometimes my own um, view of myself limits me from achieving everything that God wants for me because I can't see from God's perspective. I'm only seeing from my perspective. And so when I include godly counsel into my determining and knowing the will of God, then it begins to, then I, then I get a different perspective. I get, uh, I get a, uh, something that helps me see things differently than I would see it myself. In Philippians chapter 2, Verse 13, I'm just going to look in the New King James Version first. It says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. He works in you to will, right? He's trying to put his will in you. God wants to do that. And so, but here's what's interesting. If you look at it in a, in a different translation, this is part of how we learned how to, a couple weeks ago, talked about how we uh, interpret the Bible. Part of it is comparing Scripture with Scripture using different translations. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. In the New Living Translation, it says, For God is working in you, same as the first one, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. Here's another little hint about how we find the will of God, how we find God's intention for us on a personal level as God's intention for us comes out of our godly desires. Not every desire we have is godly, obviously. But out of those desires that our godly desires, God puts inside of our heart and puts inside of us the desires that we have, that we desire as we are born in the image of God, as we are reborn in God's uh, likeness and God's image and, and as a child of God, God puts that desire inside of us to do what's pleasing to Him and do those things that fulfill our purpose in life. In uh, Psalm... Uh, and I don't remember the exact reference at the moment, but it says this, it says, it says, he will give you the desires of your heart. Why? Because God puts desires in your heart that he wants to fulfill. That's part of how we know the will of God. So two key things in knowing the will of God. So here's prerequisite one for living a fruitful life. Knowing God's will for your life. And we do that by mostly the scripture. We get a hold of what's in the scripture, but we also bring Godly counsel and understanding the desires that God has already put into our hearts. Okay? So there's the, that's the first prerequisite. So we get that. That helps set us up to live a fruitful life. Second thing, here's where it gets really fun. The second thing is this. It says, he, he, uh, Paul's praying, and he's praying, and he says, and he says I, I'm praying and asking God to give you complete knowledge of his will, second half of verse 9, and to give you spiritual wisdom. Spiritual wisdom. Wow, wisdom is a word that doesn't seem to, um, oh, I don't know, it just seems like it's almost like it's a controversial word right now. Uh, wisdom, because here, here's, what, here's what wisdom is. Wisdom is, is good judgment. <laughs> you know, if we sum it up, because I, I often have a hard time saying, well, what's, what is wisdom? Well, wisdom is good judgment. It's being able to make good judgments on things you should do. So good judgment in spiritual things. Now, there's some places that you don't get spiritual wisdom. You don't get it from Google. I, I, I don't care what you search on Google. Google is not the source of spiritual wisdom. Go spiritual wisdom also doesn't come from good teaching or teachers. That's not where spiritual wisdom comes from. It's, it's good judgment in spiritual things, remember? It also doesn't come from prophets. You don't get good judgment. You don't get wisdom from prophets. It doesn't come from books. You don't get good wisdom from books. You can read all the books you want, but it doesn't give you good wisdom. It gives you a lot of information. It gives you a lot of information. Good, godly, spiritual wisdom, as Paul says, he gives you wisdom. We ask God to give you. Okay, there's a little hint in that. We ask God to give you. We ask God to give you. We ask God 
to give you spiritual wisdom. So where does spiritual wisdom come? It comes from our relationship with God. So the more we tie in, the more we grow in our relationship with God and His body. Sometimes people want to be connected to Christ, but they don't want to be connected to His body, and that's just a aberration. I mean, that's just not that, you know, that just doesn't make sense. But we, we need, we're connected to God, we're connected to Christ and to his body. And that second part is actually really important. It's because if we just say, oh, I'm just hearing from God about this, we run a huge risk of just fulfilling our own biases and fulfilling our own things. You know, you get, so you get a spiritual wisdom, you get spiritual wisdom out of a growing relationship with God and his body. So let me just, again, a couple caveats. You don't have wisdom just because you've been a Christian a long time because it's not tied to our age, okay? Wisdom isn't because I've been a Christian a long time. That may give you a lot of knowledge. That may give you a lot of information. It may give you a lot of experience, but spiritual wisdom doesn't come from experience. Spiritual wisdom doesn't come from knowledge. Spiritual experience doesn't come from being a Christian a long time. It comes from relationship with God and his body. Spiritual wisdom is just not connected to age or longevity. Earthly wisdom, you know, just, you know, wise people, we, we you know, acknowledge it as people, a lot of times as people get older, they have a lot of wisdom and uh, they get increasing wisdom about uh, life. But when it comes to spiritual wisdom, spiritual wisdom is a gift from God. It's not a gift from experience. It's not a gift from a lifetime. Okay, so it's not connected to age or longevity. Um, one thing, you know, and it's kind of ironic because I'm, you know, we're talking online here and, uh, and I'm coming to you digitally right now this, uh, today. And, and yet I, I've got to say this, that one of the, I think one of the big negative uh, consequences or side effects of the pandemic and, and having church and teaching and training online is that it has eliminated part of the process that produces wisdom. What I'm putting into you today is knowledge. What I'm putting to you is training. It's not wisdom. Wisdom comes out of knowledge and training when it is wrestled through with other people. When you wrestle it through with other people. So, you know, just to say this is, is that the negative side effect of the pandemic has been online teaching without in-person wrestling. See, the beauty of the body of Christ is that we are diverse is that there's so many different ways of coming at it. And Paul describes it so beautifully in Corinthians and he talks about the body with all different parts and every part is different and every part is necessary and every part is connected to the body differently and every part has a different perspective to play. And so when we get knowledge and we get training and we get teaching, as we do as we've sat alone and isolated in the pandemic and we've got all this great teaching and great prophetic insight and great learning and great preachers and all those kinds of things. So we filled our stuff up with knowledge without realizing that it's not knowledge is not the end of it. It needs to become wisdom. It needs to become good judgment. And the only way it becomes good judgment is as we wrestle it through in, in, in our relationships. Teaching without wrestling doesn't produce wisdom. It just reinforces your bias. So when you get teaching without the wrestling that comes by talking about it and sharing it and working it through together, it doesn't produce wisdom. It just produces a reinforcing of your existing bias because we consume this stuff on demand. We pick what we want to listen to. The problem is with people is they don't necessarily help us just pick what we want. They, they don't just say what we want them to say. In Proverbs, Solomon said this really, really clearly, and I think it just bears 100% on this. He says in Proverbs 27, 17, again in the New Living Translation, he says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. Let me, let me put it this way. Teaching, training, all of that, without the wrestling of a friend, only produces a dull blade. You have a blade, but it's dull. It's only sharpened into wisdom through the wrestling of a friend and the challenge of a friend. 
all those kinds of things. And, that, and that's really important. So spiritual wisdom, okay, this is the second prerequisite. Paul wants us to have spiritual wisdom. He wants us to have that, that, uh, that uh, um, good judgment in spiritual things. He wants us to be able to be, make good judgments and good assessments and be able to say, yeah, discern that. You know, it's kind of a little bit like discernment, but he says, I, I, I want you to have that. He said, but it comes through, comes through our growing relationship with God wrestled through with the body. Okay, wrestled through in relationship, okay? So the third thing, that's the third thing here, let's talk about understanding. So as Paul says again, we're gonna go back to verse nine, Colossians one verse nine, last, the last phrase, he says, and to give you, I'm, he says, we're asking God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Wisdom and understanding are two different things. Wisdom and understanding are two different things. Wisdom is our judgment, Okay, the judgment, how we, it's, in a sense, it's our, our discerning, it's our you know, knowing, yes, that's, that's a, good, uh, a good choice to make, yes, that's a good direction to follow. Uh, we have the wisdom to understand, or to, to see that we can go that direction, so there's this, this judgment that takes place. But understanding is different. Understanding, and what I think is so important about understanding is our understanding informs our expectations, or it determines our expectations. So let me... Um, let me put it this way, or let's, let's look at Ephesians chapter 3 first. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. Here's Paul, Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, and he says, And may you have the power to understand, okay, there's the word understand, as all God's people should, right? He's saying we should all have understanding. Why is he saying that? Because it's, it's foundational, it's a prerequisite to living a fruitful life, is understanding. He said, so, may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, I'm not sure, how high, how deep his love is. So he says, I, I want you to grasp, I want you to understand the extent of God's love. And then he goes into verse 19, may you experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. So he says, then you'll be made complete with all the fullness. Why is that? Because when we understand God's love, when we get a grasp of God's love, we get an idea of what we can expect. Okay, when you understand something, you know what you can expect, right? You, you know what you can uh, believe for, you know what you can do. So, you know, some things, can you comprehend? Comprehend's another good word for understand. Can you understand God's love or can you comprehend God's love? Paul's saying if you can reach in and comprehend God's love, then you'll have the expectations to live in God's love. Can you comprehend God's forgiveness? Right? We're talking about prerequisites to a fruitful life. If you constantly live with lack of understanding of God's forgiveness, it's going to limit you and it's going to, and it's going to disable you and cripple you in fulfilling and finding that, that fruitfulness in life. Can you understand God's power? Can you comprehend God's power? If you begin to comprehend God's power, then it informs your faith, right? If you can say, oh, God is this power, if I believe that, and all those kind of things. Can you comprehend God's holiness? God's holiness, that, that informs how we live our life and how we, how we behave and what pleases God because we understand and we, His holiness. So here's what Paul's saying, understanding is so important, it is, is because it informs our expectations and now, how do you get understanding? So, knowledge of God's will comes primarily from the scripture with godly counsel. Spiritual wisdom comes from teaching and training that is wrestled through with the body and with people. So it comes from uh, a growing relationship with God and with body. So that's where spiritual wisdom comes from. But where does understanding come from? So understanding comes out of meditating on the word and the stories of others. It's, a, it's an incredible thing when you're reading the Bible and all of a sudden you're reading this and all of a sudden it just suddenly makes sense. I don't know if you've had those kind of aha moments or those moments of, you call them rhema word or, or revelation. We're reading this and all of a sudden it goes, oh, that's what it means. Now I understand it. 
Now I understand it. And, it's, and it comes not because I just ran through it, but because I'm thinking about it and I'm meditating and I'm processing it and I'm chewing it and I'm, and I'm trying to understand because we're going to try to understand those things. And when we meditate on the Word of God and we just uh, hear that kind of over and over again, we read it, suddenly it goes, oh, that makes sense. Now I understand that, oh, wow, that's how big God is. Oh, wow, that's how God meant to, that's how Jesus is trying to say about forgiveness. Oh, that's what that meant. And, and you get this insight and this, you know, this moment of understanding. So I'm not believing that. And then it informs our expectations. We know what to expect. And the other side of that is, is not just through meditating on the Word of God, but also hearing the stories and listening to the stories of other people. You know, I think there's a, a very strong biblical theme from the beginning to the end of sharing the stories of God's faithfulness among ourselves. Even as Paul writes, when you come, he says, when you come together, he said, when you gather, he said, everybody should bring an encouragement or a word or something, or a little story, what's going on in your life, what God's doing for you, because here's the cool thing that happens. When I hear what God's done for you, I suddenly think that maybe he could do it for me. In uh, the book of Revelation, there's a, you know, there's a story about the, you know, all, all very metaphorical and there's all sorts of, you know, symbolism involved, but it talks about overcoming the beast and overcoming this persecution. And, and, and in one say, place, the, the, the phrase is this, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony sharing what God had done by telling the story of God's faithfulness in their life, telling the story of God's forgiveness in their life. They overcame the opposition of the enemy. They overcame those things that would keep them from becoming fruitful and fulfilling God's purpose in their life. They overcame it because they shared their stories with each other about what God was doing. I love in Luke chapter 1, verse 25. Here's a, I'm reading the new... Um, Christian version, it's NCV, and, 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 and it's, it's when Mary, the mother of Jesus, comes before, she, when she's just found out about the fact that she's going to have a baby, and she goes to visit her cousin, Elizabeth, and Elizabeth is so excited to see her, she understands that she's going to have this very special child, but Elizabeth is pregnant with, with John the Baptist, and, and, and as she's talking to Mary, she says these words in Luke chapter 1, verse 25, Look what the Lord has done for me. My people were ashamed of me, but now the Lord has taken away that shame. I mean, that has got to be an encouraging thing. Think about it. There's Mary. She's a unmarried, about to be mom in a society that her fiance just about split up with her if God hadn't intervened. And here's Elizabeth saying to her, look what God's done for me. He's taken away my shame. People tried to make, were ashamed of me, but God's taken away my shame. Do you think Mary might have felt a little encouraged? Do you think Mary might have felt, oh, I understand what God's done for you. He's going to do that for me too. And when we hear those stories, when we share those stories, we get encouraged and our understanding grows so then our expectations can grow. Our faith is often built on our understanding of the Word of God. Our faith is often built on our understanding of the revelation of God. And that's what uh, Paul says when it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It's built on that understanding and that hearing of the Word of God. So God wants us to be fruitful. He wants us to have to put effort into life and to produce good outcomes, successful, beneficial outcomes in our life this week, next week, the week to come. But the foundation for that, the prerequisites for that are those three things that we were just talking about. The knowledge of His will, spiritual wisdom, and understanding. And we can grow in every one of those three areas if we put our heart to it, if we apply it to our life. And God can build the rest on top of it. He can build the, the that, then we begin to live our life in a way that we know honors God and pleases God. And we know produces good fruit in our life. So I hope that's been helpful to you a little bit today.
and just some things to think about and maybe some things to apply. How can you increase your understanding or how can you increase your knowledge of the will of God in your life? How can you increase your spiritual wisdom? What do you need? What's in your life that you need to let somebody else sharpen in your life? So it's not just a bias, it's a spiritual wisdom. How do you, how do you grow in knowledge? What are the stories of other people that you want to encourage, you want to hear, and what word do you need to meditate on? So there's some things that will help you become who God created you to be. So that's helpful and as you apply it this week. Hey, if you're... Uh, um, you know, want to know what's going on in the life of our church and we do have all sorts of things going on from time to time and we're still in a time where we're still in a season where, uh, you know, things change and, and sometimes from week to week it feels like it changes. So if you'd like to be in the know and know what's going on, wherever you are in our region, I, if you'd like to know what's going on and you'd like to be in the know, just text your name to uh, 778-760-3800, sorry, 778-760-3800, and, uh, and we'll make sure you get on, on the list and you get notified when there's things that happen in the life of the church. Next week, if you're in one of the areas of our, um, where we have gatherings, we have gatherings in Revelstoke at 108 West 1st Street that's right above the Royal Bank, right downtown. I'd love to have you join us at 10 a.m. If you're in Vernon, uh, we're meeting at the Powerhouse Theater. And uh, that's just, I believe that's on 30th, uh, 30th Avenue. I just don't have the address. It's just the Powerhouse Theater. Everybody in Vernon knows where the Powerhouse Theater is. Just ask. And join us there at 10 a.m. And if you're in Kelowna, you can meet us here at our building in Kelowna at 2410 Ethel Street. And again, at 10 a.m., and our gatherings, we're gathering together um, as per the instructions of our provincial health officer. We're not required to uh, wear masks or uh, anything uh, or have spe specific um, capacity limitations. So if you want to wear a mask, you're welcome to. If you don't want to, you don't have to wear one. And we're just doing our best to really um, honor each other and consider each other as we continue to grow in Christ. Hey, thanks for joining us, and uh, our prayer for you this week is that you would just have a great devil-free week. See you next week.